All right. Thank you for joining us for a virtual BubanaCon 52 presentation. We're lucky to have with us today local skeptic and folklorist Ben Radford. He is going to be talking about magic cards, decks of divination and deception. Thank you so much for joining us, Ben. Well, with that, I will launch into it. Uh, yes, my talk uh, this evening or whenever you're watching is magic cards, decks of divination and deception. As you can uh, tell, I'm a fan of alliteration. Uh, and of course, it, fil it folded nicely with the, uh, the, th the theme this year. So I was delighted when Craig and Jessica was like, what do you have about this? I'm like, you know, I can come up with something. So there's many, many different types of cards and I have, there's entire books uh, written about e any one of these. So I'm just gonna sort of give a, a landscape overview of, of a handful of different uh, sort of cards. Uh, mostly playing cards, the tarot and the Zener cards. But first I wanna sort of take a step back and think about what do cards mean? What do they symbolize? Of course, oftentimes they symbolize uh, chance, fortune, randomness, uh, lady luck and things like that. Uh, but I wanna focus on, on the, the physical format of them. What, what do they do? Of course, the key to them is that they have two faces. One side is like all the rest and the other one is unique. And it's kind of obvious, but I, I think that, that sort of remembering that and framing it that way is helpful because uh, this sort of reveals their true nature. This, this sort of is why cards are so intriguing to us, is that there's this element of, of revelation. There's this element of, well, this, this could be any number of cards, 52 or, or um, uh, 87, you know, 78, all, any number. Um, but then you turn one over and suddenly you were zeroed in on one card that is seemingly specific to you. And of course, this is why they're ideal for magicians um, who routinely use things that look alike, but are in fact different. I'm not a magician. I love magic and I'm in awe of people who can do prestidigitation and other types of acts. I'm not going to go into it too much. I'm not going to re reveal any secrets, but I will just, a little word to the wise. Uh, there's a reason why magicians use uh, common ordinary objects like eggs um, and cards and uh, sometimes doves and things that that can look identical certainly from a distance uh, they're actually not and that's that's part of the the magic presentation so in a, in a larger sense basically you have this notion of this the indistinguishable ambiguity turning into a meaningful revelation through ritual that ritual might be dealing a deck of cards um, uh, doing a spread in tarot that ritual might be a uh, cardomancy when someone is handing out the cards. Uh, the ritual might, of course, be a, a poker game or a magician's trick, but there's ritual involved in it. You approach the cards, sometimes you honor the cards, depending on what you're doing. You use them uh, and then you, you put them back. And of course, in divination, you're looking for patterns and randomness. I mean, that's, that's what that is. Uh, and divination has been around, has been with us for millennia. People reading tea leaves and faces in clouds. In ancient Greece, there was a thing called heraspeciation, which is kind of grisly for the PETA folks, but basically they would they would eviscerate an animal and let its entrails out and onto the ground. And they would try and, and divine the future depending on which way the gut spread out. So kind of gross, but it gives you a, a sense of all the different ways that people have used divination and more importantly, try to discern patterns and portents uh, out of essentially random phenomena. So that random phenomena may be uh, patterns in tea leaves, that may be lines on a hand, it may be the way that the cards are shuffled and things like that. Uh, let me begin with sort of talking about some of the, the playing card superstitions, because this is, this is kind of fun. Many people have heard the phrase, lucky cards, unlucky in love. And this, this sort of this inverse correlation with how lucky you are at the table and how unlucky you are in the bed, I guess, if you wanted to force fit an analogy. Anyway, um, one of the one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the superstitions is that you should wear a dirty piece of clothing for luck as it keeps evil away. I've actually encountered this this belief uh, in, in researching the evil eye. Uh, and in many cultures, primarily Mediterranean cultures, there's this, there's this notion of the evil eye. And one way to avert the evil eye is to, is to wear something on you that is imperfect in some way. It's, it's like a, a tiny hole in some clothing or uh, sometimes people, weavers, for example, will create a, a beautiful tapestry, but leave one small error, uh, one small mistake or one, one, one part of it left unfinished. And the idea is that if you, if you try and, achieve perfection, if you fly too high, if you're like Icarus, 
uh, the, the gods will will bring you down. They 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 don't like they don't like anybody above their station, and so if you sort of humbly acknowledge some defect in in yourself or your presentation, what you're doing, then that will sort of appease the the jealous gods. And this is sort of the notion here about wearing a dirty piece of clothing for luck. Of course, you know the people you're playing cards with may not appreciate the the funky shirt that you're wearing for the third day. But anyway. Uh, you can change your seats to change your luck or walk around the table three times. Um, if, if, of course, you know, if, if you're having bad luck, the person next to you uh, probably is having good luck, right? That's, that's how poker games go. And they may not want to change uh, seats with you, especially if they're aware of the superstition. Like, hey, I've been losing five hands. Can I, can, do you want to change seats? Nope, not really. All right, fine. I'll walk around three times. Uh, the Puritans, uh, not known as fun-loving, fun-loving folk, uh, famously called uh, cards the Devil's Picture Books, which I just, I just, I just find that funny. Um, there's uh, various cards that are especially known for being harmful or bad omens, such as the Ace of Spades, and the, Nine of Di- the Nine of Diamonds. Uh, the Spades, primarily because the Spades are said to re- represent death. Um, and there's other ones as well. You can see, uh, you can see a couple other ones there on the screen. Uh, and uh, down there towards the bottom, uh, along with sort of the, the dirty piece of clothing idea, is the idea that uh, if there's a cross-eyed person at a table, uh, it means you're going to lose. Now, again, in a, in a poker game, if one person loses, is, is losing continuously, that suggests that other people are winning. So it sort of raises the question, well, what if you're the cross-eyed person, right? Then, then maybe, <laughs> maybe cross-eyed people should go into poker games, because uh, uh, if you're, if you're, if everybody around, if you're causing other other people around you to have bad luck, then uh, you, it seems to me it would increase your odds. And of course, uh, there's the the uh, the misogynistic one that women are unlucky, uh, which of course has roots going back, arguably, to the Bible and the idea that Eve uh, was uh, the the source of temptation and man's downfall. Uh, of course, in many seafaring communities, uh, women are uh, not allowed on or discouraged from going on boats and ships. The idea that somehow that would uh, do bad things. So I want to touch a little more on on cardamancy. So basically, this is basically fortune telling using playing cards. And there's four suits, uh, of course, uh, and the the interpretations and rituals take many many different forms. So I'm just sort of giving you an overview. Uh, you can easily find examples that contradict what I'm saying here because they're just such a wide variety. Uh, but the, this is sort of the, the, the general themes. So as I mentioned before, spades represent challenging tasks or events in the future. Hearts are, of course, feelings, emotions, love, relationships. Clubs represent positive things uh, that are coming in the future. And diamonds, of course, represent money and finances. Uh, and I just want to I just want to note the fact that um, there's a lot of ambiguity and crossover between these, right? I mean, you could if, let's say that somebody let's say the cards say that you're going to um, you know, have bring have uh, money coming in the future. Well, presumably that would be a diamond suit. On the other hand, it would also be a club suit because it's clubs representing positive things in the future. Uh, in the same way, uh, if you're having you know difficulty in a relationship. Um, is that a hearts uh, suit or is that a spade suit? Uh, lots of ambiguity there, which is one of the reasons why, why they're so useful uh, in terms of uh, predicting uh, the future, for example. Um, and I just want to point out, of course, there's many different suits, not just the, not just the ones uh, that are most familiar to us, which is the French suits. Uh, this is a graphic I swiped um, from uh, Wikipedia because it's actually a pretty good graphic. And it has a couple different versions, right? So the one that most, most certainly Westerners are familiar with is the, the French suit, the hearts and uh, diamonds, clovers and pikes. But uh, the, the, the Spanish suit has cups, coins, clubs and swords. Uh, and the German has uh, acorns, leaves and bells and hearts. So you can sort of, if you look, sort of look down the columns, you can see a lot of morphological and symbolic, uh, symbolic, symbolic um, associations between these. So the swords are sort of more or less uh, similar uh, in terms of the, the shape and what they do, uh, coins and tiles and things like that. Uh, I'm gonna uh, again, there's there's lots and stuff, lots of different stuff here, so I'm not gonna go too deep into it, but I'll, I'll focus just quickly on the spade suit because the spades is probably the one that it has the most association with with uh, omens and portents, as I mentioned, usually bad ones. You can read them for yourself there. You know, the ace of spades uh, represents endings and misfortune. 
Uh, the seven of spades is bad advice, uh, grief and loss. Um, nine of spades is bad luck, depression, and anxiety. Uh, and once again, you can you can sort of, you know, any of these could <laughs> frankly fit in any, any of these categories. Uh, and the the fact that they are so ambiguous and morph and amorphous, of course, helps people think that uh, that they're they are coming to true. So you might wonder, well, how how do you begin to do this, right? Okay, if you go to uh, a fortune teller, uh, how do you how do you begin the process? Well, um, one 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 early version I saw is that you begin with age, gender, and skin tone. Uh, this is a uh, this is some information I found uh, published in, in uh, 1936. Uh, it says that the way you begin reading cards is uh, it depends on whether they're young or old and how dark they are, uh, which is not PC. <laughs> but I, it, I don't even think it was PC back in 1936. But uh, yeah, so if you are uh, if you go to a, a card reader in the 30s and 40s, if you're dark, then he will uh, the, the card reader will begin uh, with the king of spades. And if you're if you're uh, lighter skinned, then maybe the king of diamonds. So. Again, a little, 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 little curious. And of course, as I mentioned, magicians use cards as well. Um, uh, card magic is one of the most successful types of magic, uh, unlike stage magic, which of course requires lots of props and area and, and, and lots of money. Usually card magic is a, is a good introductory magic for kids because uh, it doesn't require a lot of practice. You just have the deck of cards. Uh, it's their low, low entry into the, into the field. And typically, of course, they're used in close-up of street magic. Um, and uh, again, there's a there's a wide variety of, of different techniques. Um, uh, probably many of the people that are watching and listening to this are magicians magicians themselves. And I'm not going to embarrass myself by going too deep into it. But there's card forces, sleights of hand, uh, false shuffles, false deals, and so on. And there's also one other thing which I want to touch on because it's kind of fun, which is the self-working card tricks. So the self-working card tricks require literally zero effort. You don't. You need to know nothing other than just how to do the trick because it's self-working. And you can find some of these card tricks in mathematical journals of all places. <laughs> so, uh, and here's here's one uh, from um, uh, March 2006, the College Mathematics Journal. Um, and the, you can you can uh, dig up the piece yourself if you like. But I've I've highlighted there on page 104. The secret to uh, to the trick, and the secret is basically that uh, basically using mathematical algorithms. If you ask people to, if you arrange the cards in a certain way, and they and they pick a, a certain card, eventually, if you do it enough times, it will drive the card to the to the middle position in its column, and then you can pick it from there. Uh, so this is one of those sort of interesting, uh, you know, science based divination ones. So let me go on to the tarot. Um, this uh, image is, uh, here, here's uh, actually one of the opening credits from the, the, uh, the HBO series Carnival, which ran for, I think, three seasons um, about 10, 15 years ago. Um, one of my favorites, I thought it was a really, really well done series, but it does feature many, it, was, uh, it takes place in, a, in traveling carnival, of course, and it, uh, there's tarot card readers there. And uh, again, in, in the case of uh, tarot and fiction, it appears over and over and over again. So uh, I, it would... I could spend 20 minutes just listing, uh, but uh, here's some examples here on the screen. Everybody from Terry Pratchett to, of course, Stephen King, uh, Piers Anthony, um, uh, Neil Gaiman, uh, take your pick. Roger Zelazny, it's a very common popular theme uh, in, in fiction, as you might expect it to be. So let me go into some of the history of the tarot deck. Um, the, the deck actually first appeared in the early 1400s in Italy. Uh, and as I touched on before, modern decks were sort of a blend of French and Italian influences. Some people, including Aleister Crowley and others, have suggested that there's a, uh, it actually traces back to ancient Egypt, but that's, there's no real good historical evidence of that. But one of the curious things about the, the tarot deck is that even though today it's, it's mostly associated with mysticism and the occult and fortune telling, for about 400 years, it was just a card game. It was no more a cult or magical than anything else. It was just a card game. It was widely played. And in fact, a version of it is still played uh, in, in Europe uh, today. Uh, but that all changed uh, in the mid 1800s when Eliphas Levi, uh, Levy, who was a, a French occultist, uh, decided he just sort of thought about it a lot. 
and uh, a bit of a mystic himself. And he decided more or less on his own <laughs> that the, the tarot, the pre-existing tarot deck uh, actually mapped out well with, uh, with uh, the, the cabal and the cabalistic tree of life over the course of 78 cards. And so he was responsible for sort of uh, saying, okay, well, here's this deck of ba basically playing cards and here's this, this whole tradition of occult mysticism. Uh, and he just put them together and, and, uh, and basically created it. Um, and Edward Arthur Waite uh, and Pamela Coleman Smith uh, made probably one of the most popular uh, uh, tarot card decks, uh, the Rider Waite Tarot. Uh, Coleman, Pamela Coleman uh, illustrated it and, and Waite uh, wrote it. And it remains one, as I mentioned, remains one of the most popular decks today. Uh, and when they were tweaking it, they sort of decreased the, the Christian influences. For example, one of the cards was the Pope, uh, a, a distinctly Christian thing, and sort of made it more more towards what would now be called New Age or uh, you know more pagan traditions and astrology as well, which is why you see uh, some of that in these decks. So these are three examples from the uh, the weight deck. Uh, they're they're uh, very famous, of course, partly because they're now out of copyright, so anybody can use them on anything they want. Um, they, there you see the the fool, the magician, uh, pentacles, and so on. And again, I'm not I don't have uh, I don't have time to go into all the different uh, details about uh, the tarot. I just want to give you an overview. There's the major arcana, uh, and there's the minor arcana, which correspond with uh, the four suits we talked about with uh, cardamancy. Right, you've got the wands, uh, swords, cups, and pentacles, and each of them has their own uh, significance. Uh, wands, challenge, and energy, uh, cups, or emotions, relationships, and so on. As with the, the playing cards, there are any number of tarot decks, and uh, the the art that goes into them is super cool. Like, even if you're even if you're bored stiff with the mysticism and you think it's all garbage. The tarot decks themselves are so cool. I, I, I have friends of mine who, who just collect tarot decks. They've got dozens and dozens of them. Uh, and just, uh, it, it's just so evocative, the symbology and everything. Uh, and uh, again, many, many, many different ones. Uh, here on the, uh, on the screen are one of my personal favorites, which was, uh, were done by Elizabeth Leggett, uh, who is a, uh, a longtime Bubonicon attendee and an award-winning illustrator and, and a friend of mine, I'm pleased to say. Uh, and Beth, it's an amazing Ray Bradbury inspired tarot. Uh, so you can check that out if you're interested. There's of course various ways to display the cards. There, there, there's, there's different spreads. Uh, there's the pyramid, the carpet, the travelers uh, and things like that. It just depends on, on basically what you're trying to do and you know, what you think is gonna happen, um, you know, who, who you're consulting. And as I mentioned before, there's, there's basically as many different ways to, to read the, the, the cards, uh, whether cardamancy or tarot, as there are uh, practitioners. So there are some basic guidelines, you know, uh, this card means this, this card means that. But beyond that, it's heavily uh, open to different interpretation and personal preference. Um, so again, you see the seven card spread with the past influences uh, going into the final outcome. There's the, the Celtic cross. Uh, with different 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 positions meaning different things. It's all kind of complicated. Um, and if you forget, fortunately, there are some tarot uh, cheat sheets. Uh, here's one for uh, $4.30 you can get off of Etsy. Uh, so you can sort of sneak down and take a, take a quick look at it. Uh, so there's lots of uh, useful ways there. And I want to return for a second to the origin of, of the tarot because Oftentimes when you see the modern day incarnations of these things, uh, it's easy to forget that, uh, that you know, somebody somewhere along the way said that something meant something. So for example, astrology, right? The different sun signs, the, the, the Libra, the Sagittarius, the Leo, the Taurus, what have you. And, and presumably all these different sun signs have specific meanings. And one question that, that naturally comes up is who said that, right? Who 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 decided who who sat down and said, well, you know, this means this, this means this, and if you're this, then you have these sorts of things. Um, and astrology is sort of a separate thing, although as I mentioned before, uh, weight sort of melded astrology uh, and the tarot deck. But in the case of the tarot, uh, we have a very clear origin of this. As I mentioned, it goes back to Eliphaz Levy, who basically decided that he was going to give it lots of thought, 
and he decided, well, um, I, I'm a wise guy, a wise man. Um, I, I've thought a lot about this. I, I decide that X is this. And, um, and it's just interesting that the, 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 the tarot cards and, and all their, all, all the weight they carry and the, the freight and the symbology and all these sorts of things really traces back to basically one person who kind of more or less made it up. I mean, you know, he was coming from a di different traditions, but I mean, that he, he freely just sort of said, well, this makes sense to me. And he put it out there. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that there really haven't been competing interpretations of the tarot um, other than, uh, than his. So I'll move on to Zener cards. Um, and again, as long as we're talking about dece deception and divination, this is probably one of the higher profile divination ones. The Zener cards are a deck of 25 cards um, uh, of five different symbols. You have the plus sign, wavy lines, uh, triangles, square, star, and circle. Uh, and they were used in the, uh, in the 1830s to test for ESP. In fact, they were actually sold at, uh, on, on street corners, um, along with newspapers and magazines. You could pick up, <laughs> pick up a pack of Zener cards with your cigarettes and the daily paper because uh, it was a big fad at the time. So the origin of the Zenner cards is that it was uh, created by a psychologist named Carl Zenner, who designed them in the 1930s to uh, experiment with ESP, along with uh, a fellow research psychologist, J.B. Ryan. Now, if you're, if you're familiar with uh, parapsychology and the history of science research, Ryan is a, is a prominent figure. And Ryan himself was uh, interested in it because of a talk uh, that he attended by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle the, of course, creator of uh, Sherlock Holmes, uh, uh, sometime frenemy of Harry Houdini and uh, endorser of faked uh, fairy photographs in the Cottingly Fairies uh, case. In any event, uh, Ryan was intrigued when Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the respected uh, and noted uh, author, uh, said that, well, he was, he was, he said there was, there was clearly scientific proof that you can communicate with the dead. And Ryan's like, wow. I did not know that. Let's dig into this. How could we do that? And it wasn't just communicating with the dead. It was sort of communicating across minds. In some cases, two living minds, or in the case of communicating with the dead, it would be one living and one deceased mind. So Ryan became interested, uh, due in part to, to Conan Doyle, in examining ESP. And he set up a lab with, uh, with Zenner to uh, test psychic, uh, psychic claimants. So Ryan would hold up the cards and ask the subjects to say what, what design was on the back. Uh, and uh, they got they got lots of they got lots of evidence. Um, just they were just astonished. Uh, some of the early evidence was just wow, they they were just they had, they had cracked it open. They when they were doing these inner card experiments, uh, they were getting above chance. Uh, in fact, in 1934, uh, Ryan published a book titled Extrasensory Perception, uh, which summarized his parapsychology research. And he wrote, uh, quote, it is independently established on the basis of this work alone, that is the, Zen the Zener cards, that extrasensory perception is an actual and demonstrable occurrence. Now that's pretty bold. I mean, I gotta tell you, I mean, it's like, you know, we, we have these cards, we held them up and we have conclusively scientifically proven that this is true. Now, if you think about it, obviously you don't need Zener cards to test ESP abilities, right? Depending on what the ability is, if you're predicting the future, you can make you can write down the predictions and see whether they come true or not. Uh, and frankly, you could you could presumably do psychic uh, these sorts of experiments with, with any cards, right? You could if it was a, an ordinary deck of playing cards, fifty two cards, or in the case of uh, of the the tarot, you have seventy eight cards. Uh, of course it's a lot easier if you only have five symbols, right? So it's a lot harder if somebody has to say, okay, is that the pentacles? Is that a cups? Is that a sword? Is that a seven of diamonds? And so it's okay, well, let's, let's, let's simplify this. And you just have to guess uh, one of five cards. So that actually makes it much easier um, rather than have to identify a, a specific one. Because of course, somebody could just say, well, you know, the clubs and spades, in my mind, they're kind of similar, so I, I should get credit for that one. Even though I said clubs meant spades, and my psychic vision is a little blurry, so give me a point for that. They'll be like, eh. So you may be wondering, how did they do? As I mentioned, uh, you know, Ryan uh, thought that he, he got great, um, great results. 
Uh, and we can look at uh, we can look at the the distribution. So the guesses fall along a standard uh, standard normal distribution, a bell curve shape there. And again, you've got twenty five cards, five of each symbol, and most people around seventy percent will get between three and seven right, plus or minus one standard deviation. Um, and the probability of guessing eight or more is about eleven percent, and the chance of getting fifteen out of twenty is about one in 90,000, right? So if you just keep getting it right, getting it right, either uh, you're, there's strong evidence of psychic ability or you're cheating or, <laughs> and so on. So in fact, as it turns out, uh, the evidence did not hold up much to, uh, to Ryan and Zender's uh, chagrin. Uh, the, the experiments were not repeatable. Um, and a lot of the early research using Zener cards was later wholly discredited. And to today, Zener cards are very rarely used. Uh, here's a table uh, looking at the, the frequency of topics. And you can see that um, Zener cards were uh, during, this is a sample of textbook from the 80s. Uh, in, in the 1980s, there were 21 references, 1990s, eight references and 14 in 2002. And they've been largely replaced by uh, the Gonsfeld experiments where you put, uh, you basically put ping pong balls of your eyes and sensory deprivation. There's uh, other types of psych, uh, psychic testing, remote viewing, psychokinesis, and things like that. But Zinner cards have sort of, sort of gone by the wayside. Nevertheless, now and then, on rare occasions, the psychic will ask to use Zinner cards during testing. Um, this is an image of a friend of mine, um, Massimo Polidoro, and uh, his colleague Luigi, Luigi Gardicelli in Italy. Uh, he's uh, head of the Italian skeptics group. And uh, this, I think, was maybe six or seven years ago. Uh, two women approached them wanting to be tested uh, for their psychic abilities because one person said, "If she thinks about the other person, the other, the other woman can can detect uh, to detect it was." And they they wanted to use Zener cards, and so Massimo was like, "All right, let's go for it." Uh, spoiler alert: they they did uh, they didn't succeed. They they didn't get above chance. But anyway. Um, I will conclude with one last type of playing card that can actually reveal secrets and solve mysteries. Uh, this is much less uh, known than either the tarot or the cardomancy or the Zener cards, and these are cold case cards. Um, and in fact, I have some right here. And they are actually cards that are used uh, in uh, various uh, bureau of prisons, including uh, in Florida where uh, the, the, uh, the Brio prisons will, will write out missing persons and, and unsolved homicides on playing cards, decks of cards, and hand them out to the prisoners, hoping that, um, that sometimes they're called snitch cards, <laughs> if you can imagine why. And the idea is that uh, these are cases that aren't being solved anyway. And maybe if we can get you know, the stories and faces out to uh, confined, uh, you know, in incarcerated in inmates who may, you know, somebody talks and somebody have heard something, and apparently it actually has uh, so, uh, re resulted in in uh, several uh, several solved uh, cases. So thanks for watching. I hope you learned something, and of course, watch out for the nine of diamonds. As I touched on a bit ago, that is bad luck. And speaking of cards, I will just wrap up by uh, noting that I'm actually on a deck of cards myself. A uh, long time ago, maybe 20 years ago, a British uh, skeptic, uh, my name is Crispin Jago, uh, created a series of skeptic trumps cards. Uh, unfortunate name, actually trumps was the name of cards that were packaged and given out to the British, uh, British uh, kids. You could you know, you buy these little, little trading cards. But anyway, I have my own card. It's a bit outdated, uh, but my arch nemesis there, as you can see, is the Chupacabra. So that's kind of cool. Uh, if you're interested in hearing more about me, uh, I have a podcast, Squaring the Strange, and my most recent book there is on the right, Big If True Adventures in Oddity. So with that, I will bid you adieu. Thank you, Ben. I totally predicted you were going to have a card. 